one in there, so there'll be a few stragglers, but maybe let's begin. So happy belated new year, everyone. Welcome to the first grand rounds of the new year. Um, <clears throat> it was Ukrainian Christmas last uh, Friday, so I uh, <clears throat> didn't schedule anything that day. It's uh, that's <clears throat> my wife's background. Uh, so thank you for uh, holding off for an extra week. Um, and uh, it's going to be a cold weekend, but uh, <clears throat> anyway, hopefully get some skiing in. So thank you very much uh, to Edsel and uh, Taylor and Ryan, uh, who will be presenting uh, some very interesting sounding cases today. We have a great title of our rounds, Blood, Hair and Sympathetic Au Contraire. I just want to introduce uh, Dr. Edsel Ng. He's a full professor in our department and uh, also the service chief of our neuro-ophthalmology um, <clears throat> subspecialty service. He completed his MD in ophthalmology residency at the University of Toronto, and then he went on to complete three fellowships in strabismus, neuro-ophthalmology, and orbital ocular plastics at the Mayo Clinic, Will's Eye Hospital, and Allegheny General Hospital. Not to be uh, finished with that, he's also completed a master's degree in public health at Harvard, the thesis and coursework for the John Hopkins Masters of Education, as well as the Harvard Global Research uh, scholars training program and a master's of political science via the United Nations Institute for Training and Research and the Open University of Catalonia, plus a PhD at Kingston. He has more than 100 publications and hundreds of lectures, but he's most known in our department as a fabulously popular teacher of our residents, and he's received major teaching awards from both Payro and uh, <clears throat> the prestigious U of T Aikens Award for Teaching. So welcome, uh, Dr. Edsel Ng and your resident team. Thank you. Hey, maybe we can do it. Um, okay, well, it's just, I guess um, I'm up, so we'll start the slides here. We'll get right into it. That's always overwhelmed by your introduction, John. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so can everyone see my slides okay? You look good. Great, all right. So um, as Dr. Lloyd said, uh, the title of our presentation is Blood, Hair, and Sympathetic Au Contraire. Um, just special thanks to Dr. Inc. for helping me prepare this um, and uh, to Ryan for being my co-presenter. Um, so we'll get right into it. Uh, the learning objectives for um, our presentation are to analyze a case of bloody epiphora in a teenager, diagnose an uncommon lid lesion, determine the course of traumatic orbital emphysema, and predict the outcome of conservative management um, for a posterior globe rupture. All right, so we'll get right into the first case. Um, this is an 11-year-old girl with a, two episodes of new onset painless bleeding. Um, from both eyes over the last few months. Um, she has no significant path ocular history. She's not on any drops. She um, has a mood disorder for which she takes aripiprazole and fluoxetine, and she has no allergies. Um, you can see the pictures there. There's uh, blood coming sort of from the medial cantle area of both eyes. Um, and this was sent along with the referral. When the patient comes to you, her exam is essentially normal, 20-20 um, vision, normal pressure, pupils. Slit lip exam was unremarkable, um, and the dilated exam was also unremarkable. She had normal extraocular movements, there was no proptosis, and on nasal lacrimal irrigation um, was also normal. There's no blood or discharge. Um, the there's no mass in the uh, medial cancel area that on palpation and uh, uh, there was no mass in the lacrimal gland. So given that information, um, this is a poll question here. So what do you think the diagnosis is? Um, bad blepharitis, um, precocious pubis, um, or Munchausen's disease or something else? A little late launching it there, Taylor. We'll give it a couple seconds. Sure. All right, here we go. All right, something else wins the poll. Um, 
77% of you. Okay, that's great. So um, we'll just go through the differential here. I just lost. There we go. Um, so uh, a little bit more information. She had no prior tear duct surgery or stents. There was no coagulopathy or bruising um, in her past medical history on further questioning. There's no lash, lice, and um, no Munchausen's was suspected. Uh, no granulation tissue or there was no mass in the fornix. So um, what else would you like to know about this case? Dr. Taylor, you used a word I'm not familiar with, catamenial or whatever. What, what, what is that? Uh, just canthal. Oh, just canth. Is another word for canthal? Okay. Yes. Um, and um, so, what else would you like to know? The age of menarche, uh, family history of bleeding disorders, um, history of nosebleeds, or vitamin C intake, or all of the above. So, we'll give that a little bit of time. All of the above seems to be the popular choice here. All of the above, yes. So um, this could be, you know, is, it, it, that's the correct answer. So uh, she doesn't have any bleeding disorders, which could cause this. History of nosebleeds, there could be um, uh, uh, a mass in the, or a lesion in the um, nose that's causing backflow in, uh, through the nasal lacrimal ducts, or um, this could be a topic uterine tissue. And also very rarely vitamin uh, scurvy can cause this, not so common anymore. Um, but it was previously when people were less well-nourished. So um, what's important about this case is the original referral. Um, so they were referred because on their first two cycles, um, uh, onset of menstruation, they had this bleeding from their, um, uh, from their medial cancer. And uh, this was very stressful for the child and their parents. Um, we, so this is likely endometriosis or a topic uterine tissue that's causing um, these bleeding. There's also some vascular tissues that are, are vascular tumors that are hormonally sensitive that can cause um, this type of presentation. So um, we suggested to get a full coagulopathy screen and MRI orbits. If the MRI orbits could be completed um, when uh, she is uh, having her period, that would be preferable. Um, the patient is also was sent to ENT to rule out any vascular lesions of the nose. Um, and for treatment, um, there are a few options. You could do systemic um, oral contraceptive pill, but um, sometimes parents, don't necessarily want to put their 11 year old on an oral contraceptive pill. So there's some topical options that could be tried and have been described in the literature. Um, so progesterone uh, drops or tranexamic acid drops um, have been described. You could also try a progesterone cream on the forehead or lids. Um, so the family with this specific patient was given uh, the prescription for the progesterone drops, but um, hasn't filled them yet, unfortunately. And they're sort of waiting to see the ENT and uh, to get the MRI. Um, so uh, do you want, do, should we do questions now or move on to my second case? Just a, a quick comment. Uh, Catamenial is like related to uh, having uh, the periods. But, but thank you very much, uh, uh, Taylor, for uh, doing the talk. It's a really good uh, slide. Perfect. All right. Um, so um, second case, um, unusual uh, Chalazian. This was uh, provided by Dr. Segusmund. Um, the case, here we go, a 41-year-old male referred for um, painful Chalazian for three weeks with um, an unusual central excrescence. Um, past ocular history was um, unremarkable. He had no history of cancer or lid trauma and um, medications uh, he had done and was, uh, had no allergies. Um, so on exam, you can see um, uh, is, is, uh, normal vision pressure. At the slit lamp exam, um, you can see this um, lesion on the right upper lid. Um, dilated exam was normal. So if we take a look at the uh, lesion, you can see that it's along the um, lash line um, and it's a large um, uh, erythematous lesion with the cent white central excrescence that at the peak, 
Um, it was uh, painful to touch as well as very dense. Um, and when we inverted the lids, there was no foreign body or no lesions elsewhere on the head or neck. So um, an excisional biopsy was performed. The lesion was quite dry and almost had these sulfur like granules inside of it. Um, the patient didn't have a, a history of gout, but um, we sent the, uh, uh, we sent the uh, lesion in the formula and, um, for pathology, and we placed the patient on Vigamox for four times a day. Um, next poll question, um, what do you think this lesion is? Uh, granulation tissue, a pyogenic granuloma from an ingrown eyelash, uh, actinomyces from an ingrown eyelash, or a basaloid follicular hematoma, a fibrofolliculoma, a, a trichofolliculoma, or a trichoepithelioma, um, or a pilomatrixoma. Hey, you got through those answer choices pretty well there, Taylor. Well yeah. done. <laughs> a mouthful. <laughs> and there does seem to be a bit of a split here. I'll share the result in just a second. Oh, wow. Okay. So there we go. That's um, almost even split uh, through all four choices there. That's great. So our initial uh, differential was um, uh, chalazian versus granulation tissue, maybe actinomyces given the hard um, sort of uh, dense um, lesion. Um, uh, so when the pathology came back, um, this is what it showed. Um, so within the dermis, there is a well-circumscribed nodule with calcified shadow or ghost cells and areas of benign basaloid um, matricial cells. Um, the background stroma is inflamed with numerous multi-nucleated um, uh, multi histiolike cells. Um, so this is consistent with a pilomatrixoma and a specific, a specific form of pilomatrixoma uh, as a proliferating pilomatrixoma. Histologically, these are different um, than regular pilomatrixomas as they are larger in size, are mainly found on the head and neck. Um, these tumors are predominantly composed of a lobular proliferation of basaloid cells, um, and some exhibit variable, variable nuclear atypia and mitotic figures. Um, so this is what a, a pilomatrixoma usually looks like. This is in a young child. Um, and, and that's why there was a little bit of a question of um, whether this was a pilomatrixoma on initial presentation. But this is more of the proliferating type on a 65-year-old with a sort of recurrent chalazian um, for the last five months. Um, so why do these lesions occur? So they're localized mutations um, in the hair matrix cell. They're sometimes associated with somatic mutations in the CTNNB1 gene. Um, uh, this causes a loss of the beta carotene LEF1 protein complex. That protein complex is, um, is important for uh, uh, adherence between cells. So it, it, it constitutes adherence junctions. And these junctions are necessary for the creation and maintenance of epithelial cell layers by regulating growth and adhesion between cells. Um, the encoded protein also anchors um, the actin cytoskeleton, which may be responsible for transmitting the um, contact inhibition signal um, that causes cells to stop dividing once the epithelial sheet is complete. Um, this protein is also binds to um, the APC gene, um, which is the gene associated with familial uh, adenomous polyposis of the colon. Now, mutations in this gene are, are, can cause colorectal cancer, um, pyelomatrixomas, medulloblastomas, and some forms of ovarian cancer. Um, uh, alter alternative splicing results in multiple variable variants. Um, so uh, these can be associated with those conditions as well. Um, now, pyelomatrixoma themselves uh, are rarely malignant. Um, however, they can cause sort of um, a high rate of local reoccurrence. Um, and a pyelomatrix carcinoma is extremely rare. Um, so um, that's the end of my two cases. Um, any questions now, or should we move on to Ryan's cases? So this catamenial hemolacria, um, 
I was distracted a little bit while we we're trying to get Edsel back onto the panel. What, what's the exact pathophysiology? Why does the menstrual cycle uh, make the blood come in that area? So this is like this is likely like en, um, endometriosis, so a topic uterine tissue that is um, in the nasal lacrimal duct somewhere. Um, that's why it's responsive to uh, progesterone drops and probably would be responsive to systemic um, uh, OCPs as well. And is this must be something incredibly rare or is it not so rare? What's, what's the... Sorry, I, I couldn't hear you there. I was curious. It sounds like something that might be very, very rare. Um, or maybe it's not rare. I don't know. Never, obviously never seen it or heard of yeah. it. I, 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 I do think it's rare. Um, I, I actually, I think I saw this patient when I was at sick kids and, and, um, me and Dr. Ng were talking about that. Um, uh, and at that time it, it, it was staffed under, uh, Dr. DeAngelis and he said he's only seen it a few times before, but maybe Dr. Ng could uh, comment on how rare this is. Uh, it's really uncommon, but the funny thing is, I don't know if Dr. Hurwitz is listening. Dr. Hurwitz taught me so much uh, when I was a resident. I think he mentioned this the first or second day of my residency. So I've been waiting about 30 years to see it. So uh, anyway. <laughs> Fascinating case. And Ed, so what's, what's the plan for this, for this girl going forward? The, the, plan long -term drops, I, surgery. Sure. Uh, the, the plan that I, I proposed to them uh, was that she's already taking some medications uh, uh, for her ADD. Uh, and uh, I thought, uh, you know, maybe she'd want to have a regular period. So the only alternative I could think, ophthalmologically, was to get her some drops from Haber's Pharmacy. So perhaps a mixture of the tranexamic drops and also the progesterone drops, drops which are described in the literature for dry eye. So uh, we wrote down the appropriate concentrations. Um, uh, Apparently they were a bit expensive, so the family's holding off. Uh, they're uh, waiting for the uh, MRI of the nasal lacrimal area, seeing if the uh, uh, OB-GYN service has any other suggestions, and they're also uh, getting an ENT exam. Uh, if there's anybody in the city that has a lacrimal dacryo endoscope, uh, it'd be useful to look down there. However, she does flush very easily, very cooperative 12-year-old, allowing her to, uh, you to irrigate her. Also, she could just take systemic, uh, I think it's progesterone, and should give her uh, the same effect. But to, to have somebody uh, not have periods starting at the age of 11 may not be optimal. Thank you, guys. Okay, so why don't we have uh, Ryan bring up his case? Great job, Taylor. Thanks. Okay, great. Can you see the slides okay? Yep. Okay, I'd just like to thank um, uh, Taylor as well as uh, Dr. Ng for um, my inclusion on the presentation for the uh, opportunity to speak. So we'll move uh, right into our uh, third case, and this will be looking at uh, the course of uh, trauma, a uh, uh, course of uh, traumatic orbital emphysema. So here we have a 32-year-old woman who is presenting with a new red and swollen eye. The eMERGE doc calls you and asks you to review the below scans. Here we have the transverse and uh, coronal uh, cuts of the CT scan, first in the soft tissue window, and then in the bone window. And you can see these, these, these large uh, pockets of air primarily trapped underneath the eyelids, but there's also air in uh, uh, and around the globe as well uh, within the orbit. So this brings us to the first poll question here. Uh, what do you think might be the cause of this CT scan appearance? And nose blowing without a history of orbital tra trauma, a retrograde shock wave after orbital trauma without coughing or sneezing, barrel trauma after diving, a compressed air injury, esophageal rupture, working all of the above causes this appearance. We'll just give that a couple seconds to run there.
So most of the audience is all of the above, Ryan. Yeah, I think that's uh, very reasonable. And so pretty much all of these can cause uh, orbital emphysema. Uh, so in this case, we had uh, the young woman was working in a wood shop without any uh, eye protection, and there was accidental discharge from a cleaning nozzle of highly pressurized air that was directed right at her left eye. Now, fortunately, she retained very good visual acuity, normal intraocular pressure, and there was no RAPD, so there was no signs of a compressive optic neuropathy. Her EOMs were intact, and there was also a normal retinal exam. The emphysema was found to resolve after five days, and she was really left with no uh, residual proptosis. So looking at orbital emphysema, it's a common uh, radiographic sign found in about 50% of orbital fractures. And it's most often associated with medial wall fractures after blunt trauma. And it's a multi-step process for this to form. Uh, so first you have a sign or orbital communication as the initiating, initiating event. There's a forceful uh, expiratory effort that creates a high pressure gradient uh, within the intranasal space. So for instance, if you sneeze or blow your nose, the pressures can go up to 110, 120 millimeters of mercury, and that forces air into the orbit. The orbital tissue such as fat then falls back into place. It blocks the communication and creates that one-way valve. And uh, if it's significant enough, that traps uh, air can cause an acute compartment syndrome and vascular compromise. So for instance, in this case, uh, from the literature, it was a 26-year-old man who had an unrepaired orbital floor fracture five months earlier, everything was uh, seemingly okay. He went to blow his nose, uh, developed an acute uh, uh, orbital emphysema, and the pressure was so high where he developed a complete external ophthalmoplegia and uh, exophthalmos, and he uh, completely lost vision in that eye. From the CT scan, uh, you can see that the optic nerve became tethered and the angle of the posterior uh, aspect of the globe is about 90 degrees. Now, other reasons you can have oral emphysema include uh, infection, pulmonary barotrauma, post-operative complications such as dental procedures, uh, Borjas syndrome, so an esophageal rupture, as well as in this case, a compressed air hose. Uh, this was an interesting example from the literature uh, and we, you had a COVID-related uh, emphysema where uh, a 74-year-old uh, man had uh, developed acute uh, hypoxia and respiratory failure, uh, was uh, placed on positive end expiratory pressure and placed in a prone position and developed a lot of subcutaneous uh, chest emphysema that tracked up into the face and accumulated uh, behind the eyelids. Uh, in the evaluation of someone with orbital emphysema, uh, you want to start off with the basics such as vision and uh, intraocular pressure. In the case of trauma, it's very important to assess for the integrity of the globe and make sure there's no signs of a globe rupture. Uh, you can also assess for orbital integrity. Um, in the case of trauma, most often the fractures will occur at the thinnest portions of the uh, orbital wall, uh, and that includes the medial wall, the lamina capricia is going to be the thinnest portion. It's thinner than the orbital floor. Uh, however, the fractures are more in the orbital floor are more common. And in orbital trauma, uh, only about 10 to 20% um, of cases have an isolated medial wall fracture. Uh, so you can look at things like diplopia, uh, ocular motility, uh, anophthalmos, so hypoglobus, uh, and hypoesthesia trismus as well. Uh, you want to assess for signs of a compressive optic neuropathy. So in addition to the above, uh, look at pupils and color vision and also do a retinal assessment. Uh, just a quick review of anatomy. Uh, the distance from the back of the globe to the optic foramen is 18 uh, millimeters, uh, whereas the uh, intraorbital length of the optic nerve is a bit longer at 25 to 30 millimeters. So that gives some uh, slack and an S-shaped uh, configuration to the optic nerve, which does allow for some degree of proptosis without compromising optic nerve function. Uh, for uh, uh, radiological evaluation that will often be done uh, using a CT scan uh, has very good uh, imaging for fractures. Uh, if you can, um, there's helical scanning and conventional scanning. Uh, helical scanning has reduced scan times, uh, very good resolution and uh, less uh, radiation exposure, so it's particularly good for children. It's important to look for signs of muscle entrapment uh, on the CT scan, that it can include kinking or rounding of the rectus muscles. 
And uh, in the presence of orbital emphysema, uh, without clear signs of an uh, orbital wall fracture, um, you may want to speak with a radiologist to look for signs of an occult fracture of the orbit, maybe uh, hard to detect in some cases. Uh, there's overall a limited role for MRI uh, in these patients, unless you want to further look at uh, either the muscle, the optic nerve, um, or uh, signs for vascular damage. And then with ultrasound, it can be very useful to look for things like foreign bodies, uh, hemorrhage, lens dislocations, uh, particularly if your view of the globe is uh, compromised. However, you want to make sure there's no globe rupture before you place a, a probe on the eye, uh, potentially cause any um, uh, expulsion of that droplet content. Uh, for classifying uh, orbital emphysema, uh, it can be palpable uh, where the subcutaneous air is uh, restricted to the eyelid itself. With a true orbital emphysema, the air is located behind the intact orbital septum, and it can be intraconal or extraconal. In uh, orbital palpable emphysema, uh, that occurs when the orbital pressure exceeds the mechanical strength of the septum itself and air passes freely from the orbit into behind the eyelids. And that can occur at pressures of maybe 50 to 70 uh, millimeters of mercury. Uh, there's stage one where it's occult, uh, and you can only pick it up on uh, imaging. Uh, with uh, stage two, you get some globe displacement, but no uh, visual compromise. Stage three, the pressure further increases, and you can have decrease in visual acuity. And if uh, pressures get very high, uh, up to 60 or 70 uh, millimeters of mercury, uh, you can start to have a uh, retinal artery occlusion. So if that's not dealt with very promptly, of course, that can cause uh, significant permanent vision loss. So it's usually a benign uh, transient phenomenon. So if there's no uh, significant pain, there's no signs of a compressive optic neuropathy, it could be observed. Um, however, uh, if it does need to be dealt with more emergently, uh, neal decompression has been reported as a fairly simple, rapid, and uh, effective technique. Um, so you can uh, use the CT scan imaging to get a sense of where the largest pocket of air is. Uh, you don't necessarily need to remove all the air. You're just trying to deal with the either acute pain or uh, compressive neuropathy. And uh, in this case, uh, you could use like a shield over the globe would be ideal. But uh, they're using a needle uh, to um, decompress. So you want to either uh, obviously uh, direct the needle away from the, the globe itself and track maybe in along the orbital wall. Um, here they have a syringe filled with uh, saline and you can see as they uh, push the gas will bubble up and give you a sense of how much air is being removed. With a the needle there's a uh, you know, higher risk of uh, bleeding, uh, damaging the globe, maybe damaging the optic nerve. Uh, so an alternative might be to make a small uh, nick in the uh, conjunctiva use something more blunt like the nasal lacrimal cannula or the uh, blunt cannula uh, to achieve the same outcome. Uh, lateral canthotomy, cantholysis is probably something that we're more familiar with. Uh, this just shows the steps of a clean skin, uh, topical uh, anesthetic, using the hemostat uh, to help uh, reduce bleeding, and then blunt tip scissors and heavy tooth forceps uh, to perform the uh, canthotomy. Uh, locate the uh, cantal tendon and perform the release. Um, um, just uh, if you have to do the canthotomy cantholysis, it's a bit harder than in this patient because uh, there's no proptosis. But just remember, get a big forcep, a big tooth forcep. We're all used to 0 0.12 forceps, but they won't hold the skin. They'll just, uh, they won't coap. So at least the 0.3.5, you can find a tooth adsin. It's very helpful. Why do I keep on concentrating on the instrument in your non-dominant hand? It will tell you when your uh, cantholysis is done. So just pull up and out with your forcep with a, a fairly firm pressure. And when you feel the give, you've done, done your work. If you don't feel the give, you haven't released the tendon. Uh, so, sorry to, to trouble you there, Ryan. Very good talk. No, no, great. Yeah, that's a great point. Thanks. And then uh, there's other, obviously the option for surgical decompression if needed. And depending on what the etiology is or if there's other uh, sequelae going on, uh, antibiotics or steroids may be needed. I thought this was an interesting example where uh, hyperbaric oxygen therapy was used to treat orbital emphysema uh, using a protocol uh, used by uh, Navy SEAL divers. Um, there was a case where a 40-year-old female had a retinal detachment 
that was treated with uh, vitrectomy, sclerobuckle, and uh, SF6 gas. Uh, she was found to have orbital emphysema that reaccumulated multiple times despite mule decompression. And uh, when you have a, a gas bubble present, uh, its equilibration will depend on things like the volume of gas used, uh, the type of gas, its molecular weight, diffusion coefficient. And the uh, gas saturation of nitrogen is about 4.5 uh, times more soluble in fat than it is in water or essentially blood. Uh, so here it was believed that the uh, gas was accumulating in the orbital fat and slowly being released over time, and that's why it kept reaccumulating. So with hyperbaric oxygen therapy, you have a very high concentration of oxygen, so a high pressure pressure of oxygen in the blood that reduces the pressure pressure of nitrogen in the blood and creates a strong diffusion gradient out of the orbit and into circulation. And uh, they found that uh, this gave her more long-term uh, treatment of her and so i'll move on to the uh, uh final case here unless there's any uh, ryan before you leave there's a ton of questions that have come <laughs> popped up on on, on oh, these okay. crazy things so if you go, go back here uh, actually i want to take you back even further for a second so sure. the patient you presented had compressed air from a woodworking you know high pressure air hose but how does it get in there? I mean, did it scratch her skin and got in through the skin? Is it blowing directly at the eye and percolating in through the pal uh, palpebral conjunctiva? Um, you know, how is it getting in and around the eye? I mean, I realize it's compressed and it's forceful, but it still needs a portal of entry. How, how does it get in there? Yeah, it, it's not a fair question for, for, for Ryan because um, uh, he, he, he did a great job presenting a uh, the, the slide and stuff. So when I actually saw the patient, um, I asked her, uh, she, she's a very good historian. She didn't know, she just happened so fast. I presume it went through the skin because there was just a little tiny pocket in the superior conjunctiva of air. So I think it must've gone through the lateral lid. Uh, um, like she, she normally used the compressed air to clean off the, the wood shavings. And, and she was just a uh, when she turned it on, I guess it, it's like the fireman hanging on to the air hose. It just goes all over the place. And I, I think it's primarily a skin uh, penetration uh, because there's only that on the bottom photograph, you see there's only that little bubble in the superior conjunctiva. And then can you just walk us through how does the esophageal rupture take it up into the orbit? Uh, uh, that part, Ryan might be smarter, but um, air anywhere can, can cause a problem. So I think there is a case in the CJO that was written up, there's a DCR being performed. The air went all the way down to the neck, started displacing the trachea and was became a life-threatening problem. So, so air can go through any potential space. Mm -hmm. uh, so Ryan, do you know about the Borhav syndrome? Could you explain it more? Is it just the physical retching uh, that, that causes the air to be retained or? <laughs> Yeah, I, I think it's a similar idea if you have like um, retching with the esophageal rupture, um, it can create that flat, that one-way valve that forces air into subcutaneous tissue, and then it just it can track up and down, like Dr. Ian was saying. Yeah, er, earlier on in the talk, we agreed that anything hard would go to the residents, all the hard questions. I will feel the <laughs> easy one. Thank you. And in the final patient, it was SF gas leaking out of the eye. How did, how was it getting out? And why isn't that more common? Why did that patient have it? Okay. So um, my understanding is that uh, in the case of when you're doing a sclerobuckle and there's uh, SF6, it might not be pure SF6 gas. So it's only a percentage of SF6, the majority is nitrogen um, in that case. And it's the, the nitrogen that can um, diffuse through the tissues and then accumulate in the orbital fat. And, uh, and that's where it was accumulating. But you know, this is a common procedure and I've never heard of this before. So why, why in this one patient is it, is there, you know, the sclerobuckle needles went too deep and punctured the sclera? What's the reason? Yeah, they, they weren't exactly sure. They thought, they okay. thought there could be like small, small micro breaks in the sclera itself that caused like a slow release of, of tissue, maybe as part of like the surgical repair. Okay, I'll move on to the, uh, the final case then. Um, so here we have a 101 year old woman presenting post-fall and she's referred for blunt trauma in the left eye. 
Uh, so in the uh, left eye, you can see there was a chorectopia, uh, iridodialysis, a displaced uh, IOL, a supertemporal haptic can be hard to see here, but the anterior segment appeared to be intact. On the right eye, she had corneal dystrophy, but the uh, IOL was well positioned. So her visual acuity is 2080 in the right eye and a only light perception in the traumatized eye. And she had normal intraocular pressures, although there was some difference between the two pressures. And so in an elderly patient, you wanna make sure that there's no uh, intracranial bleeding going on. So a, a CT scan was done that showed no dural, uh, uh, subdural hemorrhage. But you can see there was a, a squaring off of the left lobe and also uh, the lobe was misshapen as well. Uh, so what we had in this case was uh, a 101 year old patient presenting with a posterior lobe uh, disruption, but an intact interior segment. So in that case, what would you do for the patient? Schedule an immediate globe repair from the emergency room, uh, schedule a globe repair within one or two weeks on a normal schedule, or observe and refer to retina for their opinion. Give it a couple of seconds to run, but of course this is made even more complicated these days the 101 year old in COVID um, being so prevalent. So, well, we see this. So most of the audience is consolidating one, around one response here. Okay. Yeah, so the majority uh, chose to observe and refer to that in for opinion. And uh, that's also uh, the approach that was done in this case. Um, so there's a long discussion with the patient, uh, the son and the grandson. Uh, the decision was made to uh, uh, start on Toberdex, uh, place a shield to protect the globe, and the patient was willing to see retina and, and had a consult with them, but ultimately declined any surgical intervention. Uh, she was uh, followed uh, for a number of visits. Uh, she so far has not developed any iritis in either eye. With the uh, right eye, with her uh, corneal edema, she was started on neuro to try to optimize uh, visual acuity there, and she remained like perception in the left eye. So I'll quickly just touch on the um, concept of the ocular trauma sto uh, score. Um, so it's based on uh, analysis of about 2,500 patients. And uh, it's used just to get an idea of what the prognosis might be in the setting of ocular trauma and what the final visual field uh, might be at uh, six months. So it's useful for the uh, physician in, in counseling the patients, their approach to management, and for the patient as well. Uh, after trauma, there can be a lot of uncertainty and anxiety. And, and maybe at least knowing what to expect uh, may help with that. And so it's based on one functional and five anatomic uh, characteristics. So uh, first is the visual acuity. Uh, if you start with no light perception, it's 60 points, all the way up to a full score of 100 points if your uh, visual acuity is 20, 40 or better. And then you further subtract points if there's a perforating injury, a retinal detachment, RAPD, a globe rupture, or endophthalmitis. And then you're left with a sum of these raw points, and that gives you some sense of what the visual acuity might be. Um, so in our case, uh, the patient's score would have been 37, and uh, they presented with light perception um, uh, vision. So in uh, statistically, at least, it would be unlikely they would uh, get much uh, improvement from that. It would be in the no light perception, but hand motion. Uh, for a called globe rupture, so it's a traumatic dehiscence of the sclera at or posterior to the rectus muscles. It's often difficult to diagnose, but uh, quite important for uh, preoperative protection, uh, making sure that there's a, a shield uh, on the globe to reduce the, reduce the risk of herniation of ocular contents. And um, at the consideration of urg urgent surgical repair to optimize uh, the visual prognosis. And prolonged hypotony can be associated uh, with things like ciliocloidal effusion and uh, delayed cord hemorrhaging. Uh, it's difficult to diagnose for a number of reasons. Uh, in the setting of trauma, there can be a lot of lid edema or hematoma that um, uh, makes it very hard to assess the globe. Uh, the uh, traumatic hyphema is frequently present, uh, often obscures slit lamp visualization of the AC, which is an important uh, consideration when trying to uh, diagnose an occult globe rupture. Uh, there may be a uh, vitreous hemorrhage present, unreliable relative hypotony, which I'll touch on on the next slide. And the uh, anterior chamber is typically deeper than normal. Um, and that's in contrast to a corneal or limbal ocular, ocular wall defect that tends to have a shallowing of the AC. 
So some cardinal signs of an occult uh, globe rupture. Uh, the first is a deepened anterior chamber and posterior iris retraction. So you have this uh, posteriorly displaced uh, plateau iris configuration. It can be seen immediately after the uh, acute ocular trauma. And here it's very important to compare the traumatized eye with the uh, contralateral eye to get a true sense of if there's that, that deepening of the AC. Uh, an ultrasound or CT scan uh, could be useful in detecting this if your view is obscured by hyphema. And uh, you can get deepening of the AC in, uh, in other uh, pathology, such as maybe an iris retraction, uh, but it would not be in the acute traumatic setting. And a traumatic subluxation or dislocation of the lens in the setting of trauma can also give you a deep AC, but you wouldn't expect this iris configuration. Uh, you may also have a relative hypotony, so you're looking for two millimeters of mercury or more difference between the two eyes. So in this case, it is uh, a difference of five. A very low IOP is highly suggestive of an occultable rupture, and that's caused by the aqueous or vitreous loss through the rupture. Uh, however, it's important to keep in mind you can't have a high uh, IOP with a globe rupture. There's high orbital pressure or intraocular hemorrhage. And uh, you can also have a low uh, uh, pressure without a globe rupture, for instance, if you have ciliary body shutdown. Uh, there may be uh, moderate to extensive chemosis, often uh, circumferential, and that can be caused by the leakage of, leakage of the aqueous or uh, vitreous through the uh, ocular deficits and also vitreous hemorrhage. Uh, some softer signs would be uh, very low uh, presenting visual acuity, present RAPD or hyphema, or reduced uh, ocular motility. Uh, so of course, if you have a globe rupture, you're concerned with um, the potential for sympathetic ophthalmia. And um, so that's gonna be a, a bilateral diffuse granulomatous T-cell mediated pan-uveitis. Um, right now, vitreoretinal retinal surgery is probably the commonest risk factor just because it's uh, performed so commonly, but it does have a very low preference of about 0.01 to 0.06%, and it can occur also in penetrating or perforating ocular trauma. Uh, timing varies uh, widely from uh, days to decades uh, after the inciting incident. However, about a third will occur within three months and half will occur within one year. Uh, it's uh, granulomatous uh, uveitis, so you have uh, things like uh, mutton fat KP or Busaka nodules you might see uh, at the slit lamp. It's uh, primarily uh, epithelial cells and lymphocytes on pathology, uh, rare to see more neutrophilic uh, reaction. And characteristically, it spares the choreo capillaris and retina. Uh, there's the very closely related uh, VKH, which is, which is uh, pathologically very similar, except it's not associated with uh, acute trauma. They're both uveal, uh, both directed against uveal melanocytic uh, antigens. Um, and in the uh, prodromic uveitic phase of VKH, it can also spare the chorio capillaris, but in the chronic and recurrent phases, it would involve the chorio capillaris. So that's uh, a distinguishing feature. Uh, Dr. Ng uh, was involved in a, a meta-analysis looking at the incidence of sympathetic ophthalmia after trauma. Um, there was some uh, difficulty in, uh, in uh, these sorts of studies because uh, papers don't always uh, look uh, or at least report the location of trauma for anterior versus posterior, the type of trauma or the extent of injury. However, uh, they looked at 24 studies in total about 12 of which um, that comprised uh, over 1,400 patients did not report any cases of sympathetic ophthalmia. And the overall incidence proportion was at 0.19%. And the incidence rate was 33 per 100,000 person years. So this is, again, a very, uh, a very rare uh, occurrence. Now, looking at a study by uh, Jordan and, and Dutton, uh, they looked at uh, almost 800 cases of sympathetic ophthalmia um, and about 125 occurred after nucleation or evisceration. So it's not that uh, these surgical procedures will um, guarantee that this does not happen uh, in the future. And they also looked at the lifetime risk of uh, SO following evisceration. If there's no uh, predisposing factors, it's about one in 840,000, so very, very rare. If there are predisposing factors, such as a penetrating or perforating uh, trauma uh, with or without uveal, um, exposure of uveal tissue, 
Okay, it's about one in 55,000. So again, these are very rare and you're kind of looking into the odds of you know, dying by a lightning strike or dying from fireworks. So it's a very rare event. Um, and there is benefit to the potential of retaining the eye uh, in trauma. Um, some studies have looked at patients that presented with NLP vision. For instance, there was a study by uh, Agarwal. They looked at 27 patients that presented with NLP uh, vision in the setting of a globe rupture. And uh, they found that while about two thirds remained NLP, uh, there was the potential for patients to get to hand motion and 2400, 2200 vision. And uh, that may not be very useful if the patient has a, a good seeing normal um, contralateral eye. But if there's ever damage or issues with the contralateral eye, uh, that sort of vision could be uh, navigational, very important for the patient. Uh, retaining a blind bicycle, a disfigured eye, uh, can also help uh, reduce um, the occurrence of things like phantom vision or phantom pain associated with the removal of the eye, uh, as well as the psychological importance of uh, retaining the eye for the patient. And um, there have been studies uh, that have also looked at um, the 14-day rule, and it seems like that was a bit more historical and uh, observational. And you can certainly have cases of sympathetic ophthalmia, even if the eye is removed within 14 days of trauma. And um, back of the interval calculations have been done looking at um, 10,000 theoretical patients that have had a uh, called globe uh, rupture or, or anterior globe rupture. And because it's such a rare instance for sympathetic ophthalmia, and now we have better treatments uh, that include uh, corticosteroids and immunomodulators, um, you'd have to perform out of those 10,000 patients about 9,999 prophylactic inoculations to prevent one case of sympathetic ophthalmia that has a, a significant reduction in visual acuity as the outcome. Um, so overall, it's just that um, efforts should be made to try to retain the eye when possible and uh, consider something like inoculation or evisceration if there's no possibility of a visual or cosmetic rehabilitation for you. That brings us to the final slide. So uh, today we talked about a case of bloody epiphora in a teenager, uh, diagnosed an uncommon lip lesion. I determined the course of a traumatic orbital emphysema and uh, predicted the outcome of management of a posterior globe rupture in the sentinel. Great, thank you, Ryan. I think there may be a question from Ted. He's got his hand up here. Ted, if you're there, you can go ahead. Or it may be a false hand. Sorry, it was a false hand. Sorry about that. <laughs> no worries, no worries. Nice to see you, Ted. Uh, Ryan, question for you. Can, 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 what was the number needed to treat there? I missed that. That's a useful number to know. Oh, in terms of like that kind of like back of the envelope type calculation? I think, you, did you just mention a number needed to treat to prevent one case? Like how many enucleations you need to do to prevent yeah. one? So they kind of did like a back of the envelope based on like the instance of uh, sympathetic ophthalmia and how good treatments are these days. So out of like 10,000 theoretical patients, <laughs> you'd have to perform 9,999 prophylactic inebriations to prevent one significantially bad outcome from sympathetic ophthalmia. So in the setting, of, open, in the setting of an open globe injury. I think that's right. Wow. Yeah. Because most patients will either will already have maybe poor vision in the affected eye, and the treatment if sympathetic ophthalmia was to occur in the fellow eye is quite good. So it, it, chances are they would recover their vision fairly well, um, even if it were to occur. Uh, thanks. That's a great number to know. Thank you. Well, and so Ryan, is the take-home message now that we shouldn't really let sympathetic ophthalmia? influence our management? It should basically be what's, what's the management independent of that risk then? Yeah, I, I mean, maybe Dr. In can speak to this as well. My understanding is, you know, it's important to present that as a risk for the patient where there could be a slight increased risk of it in the fellow eye if they were not to have something like an evisceration, um, but it's an incredibly rare uh, occurrence. And there are benefits from retaining the traumatized eye. There's the potential for some visual acuity recovery, maybe decreased phantom vision, phantom pain. And it's also a good scaffold um, for prosthesis and better uh, motility uh, of a prosthesis later on. Um, so the, I think the fear maybe of sympathetic ophthalmia shouldn't completely drive the decision for uh, evisceration. It's just a consideration. 
I, I think Ryan uh, said things very well. Um, um, it's been about 30 years. I, I remember uh, uh, in some practices, uh, when I first started off, they said, you know, we'll give you, we'll give you this case, you have to do it within two weeks. Uh, I think Dave Jordan says it better. Uh, the two week rule is apparently some rule from veterinarians with uh, uh, talking about horses. I don't know if it applies to humans. It, it just doesn't seem like the big specter it was before. The other thing too is um, eviscerations are more commonly being done for trauma cases than enucleations. There's always a fear of sympathetic with eviscerations and that hasn't uh, uh, been a significant factor either. Uh, as Ryan mentioned, I think the bottom line is discuss the risk with the patient what do you want? To, uh, what did, would they prefer to do? And, and just document it. But I don't think there's this huge rush um, to, to remove an eye. Now, all that being said, the studies are going to be biased because the really bad traumas uh, may, may undergo evisceration or nucleation. Occasionally, we'll have a globe rupture that, that you just can't salvage the eye. So those would be taken out of the mix. Um, so. So that, that's the uh, comment on the made analysis. Like you're not accounting for the zone of injury. Uh, same thing, the ocular trauma score. They, you should uh, account for things like the zone of injury. Uh, the zone of injury that they use in trauma calculations is different than the ROP zones, by the way. Yeah. Very cool. And actually, there was a very cool link from Anthony Cabrera posted in the chat about the Virgin Mary. So uh, that goes back to the bloody epiphora earlier. So if you guys want to check that out, please do. It's in the chat box. Uh, there's no other questions from the audience. Um, so we, we are a little early, but we can probably wrap it up, John. Actually, yes, I think there were <clears throat> fabulous title, fabulous talks, really interesting cases, most unusual, very much food for thought there. Thank you very much to uh, Dr. Ng and Taylor and Ryan for presenting. Um, and I, uh, <clears throat> I hope everybody has a very nice, nice weekend. And I'm going to actually rush off because my dog is going ballistic to go outside. So thank you very much. And we'll see you next week. Enjoy your weekend, guys. Bye. Great job. Thank you.